everyone. I appreciate everyone staying here, even though this is the last lecture of the day. I have to dispel some myths. There were some rumors going out around that we would be passing out free samples of ketamine. So unfortunately, that will not be the case. Nevertheless, we are going to have a rousing educational discussion. And I'm very excited because this is an opportunity for us to, or rather for me to present some original research. And research in general in EMS is something that's really coming to fruition now. High fidelity studies that are meaningful, that are practice changing, that are guiding our management pre-hospitally. And we're fundamentally building that evidence base to support our subspecialty. So without further ado, uh, ketamine induced rapid sequence intubation. And we also want to say hello to everyone that's watching on Periscope. Thank you so much for joining. Please tweet out your questions or Periscope your questions. We have a fantastic host of Twitterati in the audience, so certainly they're able to field those questions. So the title of our study, okay? The title of our study, we've come a long way in the last couple of years, but you know, there was a lot of resistance to ketamine, not only in the emergency department space, uh, but certainly within the pre-hospital space. So we entitled it Skeptic. Safety and Efficacy of Ketamine in the Emergent Pre-Hospital Tracheal Intubation. The study time period was from January 1st, 2014 and extended till the end of February in 2015. And we included all folks who had an RSI in our pre-hospital system. And just as a caveat, I know there's mostly flight folks here. This is uh, primarily a ground study. About 10 to 15% of the RSIs were done in flight. So vitamin K. We all know it. We all love it. And just by a show of hands, how many folks have access or used ketamine in their pre-hospital practice? So a good, I would say, 75-80%? Fair enough. So you all are the elite of pre-hospital care, primarily uh, in the air, doing what you do best. On the ground, for general ALF care, ketamine still tends to be a uh, touch controversial, and we're certainly advocating for its broad-based uh, broad use and acceptance by building the evidence base here. So this is a package insert, it's a dense slide, but the reason I included it, just to understand a little bit more about the pathophysiology of ketamine, what's most commonly used in the US is something called ketolar, which is a racemic mixture of ketamine. And what that means is simply it's a stereoisomer, there's a, a right-sided version and a left-sided version. They're essentially mirror image of each other and they uh, are in constant equilibrium. We'll get into a little bit about the controversy with ketamine. There are some folks who ad advocate that the S enantiomer or isomer may have better hemodynamic properties than the R enantiomer. That's not necessarily borne out in literature, and the literature in general is scarce, especially in terms of the pre-hospital use of ketamine. Very little for us to hang our hats on. So the reason I also, another packet insert, so I'm just going to read this here. The elevation of blood pressure begins shortly after injection reaches the maximum within a few minutes, and usually returns to the pre-anesthetic valley within 15 minutes after injection. And the reason I mention that is by no means is ketamine a hemodynamically neutral induction agent. And that is awesome. Intentionally, we're using ketamine for those patients that are in shock state, that are hemodynamically stable, that are teetering on the edge of peri-intubation hypotension, and in fact, cardiac arrest, right? So ketamine is a tool in our arsenal that we can potentially selectively use for those sickest patients in shock states to optimize our pre-hospital care. Now, getting serious here, but etomidate is controversial, and there has been debate that even a single dose of etomidate can suppress your inherent catapults 24 to 48 hours later in the ICU. And just a mechanism here, uh, Etomidate is a reversible antagonist of the 11 beta hydroxy hydroxylase enzyme. So essentially, you're having less systemic cortisol, which is your stress hormone, which is going to amp up your blood pressure. So even a single dose of ketamine can potentially cause hypotension in your sickest patients several days later, right? Why even engage in the controversy? It's not necessary. Pull yourself out of that equation and use an agent that is intentionally not hemodynamically neutral, ketamine. Furthermore, Etomidate has no anesthetic properties. Ketamine, we know we also, based on uh, our you know, ketamine curve, is going to provide significant analgesia as well. So think about your, your hypotensive traumatic brain injury patient, right? You're using Etomidate, maybe you're a little bit more sophisticated, you'll use rocuronium. 
but you're not adding any anesthesia quality to that inherently very painful process, endotracheal intubation. So no, nobody's probably heard of airway cam, right? Dr. Richard Levitan talks about instead of RSI as rapid sequence intubation, resuscitation sequence intubation, right? Resuscitate your patient before you intubate. There's almost no reason to do a crash intubation any longer. Even if you're there, your patient is teetering on the edge of cardiac arrest, by inducing them and starting your positive pressure ventilation, they're almost certainly gonna have a hemodynamic collapse. Resuscitate before you intubate. Use judicious use of sedatives, make the procedure as non-distressing as possible, and your primary objective is to keep your patient alive during the intubation process. Okay, keep your patients alive. So another thing probably nobody here has heard of, right? Nobody here has heard of this? Kind of, sort of, a little bit? Dash 1A, right? So definitive airway, sans hypoxia, and let me hear it, come on guys. Hypotension. Hypotension, hypotension matters during your RSI process. This is very, very important. We know during the San Diego RSI studies that in fact paramedics were intubating patients and not realizing that they were getting hypoxic or hypotensive, and that resulted in a significant worse outcomes in both morbidity and mortality, right? This is what we use every single time when we're talking about our airway mantra, definitive airway, sans hypoxia, sans hypotension, and we wanna get that tube on the first attempt. Let's optimize our process to make that happen. So from our uh, foam ED friends, life in the fast lane, what exactly is peri-intubation hypotension and why does it happen? So first of all, it's significantly associated with worsening morbidity and mortality in our patient population. And we talk about the mechanisms of peri-intubation hypotension, right? It can certainly be to the underlying disease of your patient. Maybe they're septic. Maybe they have a pericardial tamponade. Whatever the reason for their shock state, um, they're likely to get worse after you intubate them. And inadequate resuscitation. So again, we're gonna harp on those same things. Resuscitate before you intubate. Optimize your patient's outcomes. Um, use, uh, you know, you're gonna start a line, whether it's IV, IO access, you're gonna start some fluids. Without a doubt, we're gonna talk a little bit about push dose pressors. It sounds like in the last couple of talks, that's been some items that have been mentioned. And we're gonna use an agent that's not hemodynamically neutral, AKA ketamine. Um, as soon as we start ventilating the patient, that positive pressure ventilation is going to decrease my venous return, right? We're starting to understand a lot more about intrathoracic pressure regulation because of Dr. Keith Lurie and the ITD device and active compression decompression. The pathophysiology of intrathoracic pressure regulation is something that we're learning quite a bit more about. But the flip side is also true. He talks about negative intrathoracic pressure. When we introduce positive intrathoracic pressure and we're ventilating that patient, the venous return is going to decrease, they're likely to be more hypotensive post-RSI. And then hemodynamic uh, effect of worsening acidosis during apnea, certainly. So talking about now getting into our literature here, these were our data points. And as you can see, there are quite a few things we were looking at from our PCR. So we had an arsenal of medical students who were super eager, not only to get excited in pre-hospital research, but I mean, it's ketamine, forget about it, we're lining up. So, we had them go through our uh, PCRs, it was a retrospective review, and we also um, abstracted all the monitor data and were able to incorporate that within our data analysis as well. So that's our methodology, we're essentially looking at um, pre-RSI vital signs and post-RSI vital signs, and we collected a whole host of demographic data, as you might imagine, for any sort of research study. So, shock index. Shock index equals heart rate divided by blood pressure. Now I want to take a quick poll of the audience. How many of you all empirically use shock index when assessing your patients, or critically ill patients, certainly? Dr. Hinckley, anybody else out there? A couple of folks here and there. And I just want to sell shock index to you as a very useful <coughs> tool to help gauge uh, or help assess your most critically ill patients as hypotensive shock state patients, right? It costs you zero dollars, and basically it's just a quick calculation of heart rate over SVP. Okay, very cheap, and let's run through some uh, heuristics, right? So let's say a patient's normal. So a heart rate of 80 and SVP of 120. Your shock index is 0 0.7, so that's our normal, okay? 
So I want to explain this concept very uh, clearly because the further research is going to be based on this. Now let's take a sick patient, right? Reverse those numbers. Heart rate of 120, SVP of 80. Sick patient, everyone agrees? Right. That shock index is 1.5. So let's understand, the higher the shock index, the sicker the patient is. The higher the shock index, the sicker the patient is. And um, just to share, some folks are using this in their pre-hospital algorithms for TXA administration. I know that uh, last week when we spoke about this at Echo Philly, Boston MedFlight mentioned that as part of their TXA administration criteria, they're using shock index. Now why is this important? So shock index has been shown to be a predictor of vasopressor use in the emergency department. And the reason I included this study is all my mentors from Yale, Dr. Chad Weira, as well as our IC medical director, Dr. Mark Siegel. So correlated with increased vasopressor use. Um, pre-hospital shock index is associated with the need for increased blood transfusions in the pre-hospital space. That's certainly something that's important and relevant. And then finally, shock index in your polytrauma patients is in fact associated with mortality. So if you can know that up front, at a cost of zero dollars, it's a very quick calculation and it's significantly gonna help guide your resuscitation and your overall goals of care for that patient. So think about using shock index. Now, running through our data set. So what we did was we uh, divided our group into three different samples. So our hypertensive cohort we classified as an SVP of greater than 140, our normal intensive is between 111 and 140, and our hypotensive, uh, we took some liberties here just to increase our sample size, was less than 110 systolic blood pressure. And we see that in, uh, in the hypotensive and normal intensive group, both had 41 patients. And in fact, the majority of patients were hypertensive, which is interesting. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about that, but the goal was actually to identify that cohort, those patients that are in shock that selectively benefit from the ketamine-induced rapid sequence excitation. So here we go, here's the meat and potatoes. So median shock index. So we'll start with our hypotensive cohort right in the middle. So we started with a pre-RSI shock index of 1.05, and our post-RSI shock index is 0.93. So remember, higher is worse, lower is better. So we in fact showed a statistically significant improvement in the shock index with an induction of ketamine. In our normal tensive group, it stayed about the same. And very interestingly, in our hypertensive group, we in fact had the opposite effect. So we started with a shock index of 0.59, and we increased the shock index to 0.67. We'll talk a little bit about the hypothesis behind why that may have happened. Now, as I mentioned, our hypotensive group was defined as an SVP less than 110. But we want to really, really get a better understanding of the sickest patients. So we said, let's take that sample and look exactly at those folks who are in shock, who have an SVP less than 90. And we found that our pre-RSI shock index, 1.24, so 6 sick, improved to just under 1, 0 0.96, and that was statistically significant and very exciting for us. We were super pumped that ketamine is showing an improvement in our shock index, especially in the sickest patients, our hypotensive uh, cohort or subgroup analysis. So moving along, we just so you know, shock index is new to most folks, just to correlate that with SVP, okay? So again, looking at our shock group, our SVP went from initial of 78 to 92, better, yeah? All right, you're buying it. Uh, hypotensive, same thing, went from 100 to 105, and both were statistically significant. Normal tensive state about the same, and we found in the hypertensive group we were saying that we noticed that there was a decrease in our systolic blood pressure from 170 to 141. Now, overall in our study cohort, the dose of ketamine averaged about two mg per kg for all comers. And we're like, wow, that's very interesting. When we introduced our RSI protocol adding ketamine, we also introduced ketamine for post intubation sedation. And that's something that we're still working on optimizing, certainly in the pre-hospital space, will induce, but the, on the post-intubation side, it's often uh, inadequate or insufficient sedation for our patients en route to uh, the hospital or emergency department. So we broke that data down further. Um, now in our hypersensitive group, so this is pre-hospital RSI, this is our induction dose in the light gray, and our dark gray is our total dose of ketamine that the patient received 
and the majority of that is on the flip side with post-intubation sedation. So for a hypotensive group, there's a little bit of controversy into what the ideal dose of ketamine induction is for the sickest patients. And in general, protocols around the country are ketamine induction dose is anywhere from one to two milligrams per kilogram. Nevertheless, when you poll experts, when you poll world-class experts, people who use ketamine on a daily basis, anesthetists, uh, emergency docs who are highly, uh, you know, in tune and have great acumen with this drug, most folks will say, for those patients that are hanging on by a catapulting threat, right, they're just hanging on, they're maxed out on their inherent catacold, it may in fact be beneficial to have your dose of ketamine. So use a lower dose induction agent, so something along the lines of 0.5 milligrams per kilogram. We don't necessarily have data to support this, but this is essentially an expert opinion or consensus opinion. Okay, so we tried to answer that question with our data sets. It's a little bit complicated. And this is also a retrospective review, and it's not the, we want to understand the limitations of our research. It's not designed to answer this question, but I'm a very curious person and individual that begins with. So nevertheless, I wanted to ask the data the question. Is there an optimal dose that we can define for ketamine in our hypotensive group? So what we did was, um, we took all our hypotensive patients, 41, with an SVP of less than 110. On my y-axis is the shock index. And on my x-axis is the total dose of ketamine in a mix per kg. Okay. So first of all, I want to say that we were not able to find a statistically significant answer. But nevertheless, there were some interesting trends. Do I have a laser pointer here? Maybe? Not so sure. But anyway, regardless, we look at around 1.2 to 1.3 as our ketamine dose. The lower ketamine dose, we found improvement in shock index. And when we go to the higher doses, 2 and 2.1, we found a trend towards worsening uh, shock index. Hey friends, I'm going to take a brief moment to pause the show and bring you a word from our sponsors. No, not the sponsors you may traditionally think of, but rather sponsors that are aimed to help eliminate healthcare disparities. This is a very special project I'd like to announce during EMS week for folks to trial. It comes at absolutely no cost and is ultimately designed to optimize your training experience and help translate into improved outcomes within your community in relation to out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Recently, a group of colleagues of mine and I had the pleasure of coming together and reviewing the science and literature on feedback in CPR, and the data pretty much speaks for itself. Dr. Bobro, the state EMS medical director of Arizona, has done tremendous work on this, and we now know that all the major defibrillator companies come with some sort of active CPR feedback. Nevertheless, we are acutely aware that once you know a single EMS system, you know a single EMS system, and budgetary constraints are real-world problems and challenges. Not everyone can afford the defibrillator component to their device. So what have we done is designed a watch app for the Apple Watch called Perfect CPR. Now, we should be very important to state this is designed for training purposes only, but nevertheless, once a provider opens up the app using the accelerometer and gyrometer built into the Apple Watch, you will be able to get direct feedback on your rate, depth of compression, as well as recoil. So please check this app out. It is available at $0.00 in the Apple Watch iTunes Store, and it's called Perfect CPR. Please also find us and follow us on Twitter at Perfect CPR. Again, we're beta testing for this. Very excited to launch during EMS week at a cost of $0.00 and would love your feedback. We can all do a part to help improve the health disparities within our country. And feedback is definitely a requisite component to that. Check us out. Now, same thing, it's a little bit easier to understand this graph. Same thing, just looking at the SVP. So lower dose of ketamine had improvements in SVP in our hypotensive cohort, and higher doses had the opposite effect, worsening in SVP in our hypotensive cohort. So interesting stuff. Again, prospective research is required. It's certainly a limitation of our study. But I just wanted to ask a question to see if our uh, data set 
had any uh, insight into that question. Now, just talking about some general categories, this is the nature of the EMS call types. So about 50% were uh, respiratory-related complaints. About 20% of our sample happened to be traumatic patients. And we've come a long way in dispelling uh, a lot of myths related to ketamine. And certainly one is ketamine in your uh, TBI patient or head injured patient. We know that the actual metric that we're looking at is your cerebral perfusion pressure, right? That's what we care about, not your ICP uh, just by itself and isolated. In fact, ketamine is gonna improve your cerebral perfusion pressure and is an optimal agent in your hypotensive TBI patient. Uh, about 20% were neuro, 1% were hard, 8% were other. Now, total RSI jobs during the study, we had 427. Um, a small percentage, 8%, we used the superglottic airway to secure our advanced airway. Now, this is one of my favorite slides here. So this is from the beginning of the study period till the end. So the incidence of ketamine use for our inductions. So we found that when we first introduced it, uh, medics were nervous, like, oh, I'm not sure about this ketamine, I'm not sure what's gonna happen. So our, you know, as with the many things that you initially introduced, there's a slow rollout, gradual uptake, and as folks began to get more comfortable with ketamine, they started using it a lot more often. And uh, the way it works for our ALS ground medics is um, they have to call online medical control and they can request certain drugs, ultimately without the discretion of the physician answering the call, but nevertheless, we saw a significantly increasing uptrend towards ketamine. And as EMS medical directors, we certainly advocate for the paramedic as a pre-hospital care professional, right? So taking ownership of that patient, optimizing their outcomes, right? Scoop and run versus et cetera, et cetera, is outdated. Rather, we want to advocate for thinking and acting. So part and parcel with that, as soon as we were starting to get our data out, we were excited to share that with our ground troops and medics. And some of our preliminary data came out in November. We were sharing that via social media. And people got very excited and uh, roused uh, the troops. And uh, we saw an uptick in ketamine use at that, at that stage of the game. Now, this is another one of my favorite slides, the reverse. So, the, <laughs> the inherent use of etomidate uh, in our RSI processes. So I just want to ask the emergency docs in the room, in regards to your own RSI practices, how many of you guys are finding that you use etomidate a lot less? Yeah, most EM, EM docs are using etomidate a lot less. And then for my... Uh, Pre-hospital care providers, is this something that's echoing true in your own practice? Fair enough, right? So etomidate, we know, is not hemodynamically neutral. Why don't you take that out of the equation? Don't play that controversial game. Optimize your patient outcomes with a positive hemodynamic agent like Kevin. So, further, we wanted to look at, you know, ideally we were looking at our septic shock patients, and those are patients we felt that would ideally benefit from ketamine as an induction agent. So we took our entire uh, hypotensive cohort, and I sat down and reviewed all the PCRs. And basically we were able to see in our hypotensive group, this is the N of 13, a majority of them presented with a sepsis-like picture. And in our hypotensive group, this was also the same. And the reason this is important, or rather the reason we're able to make this uh, conclusion, this was just around the time that we were all very excited about Ebola, and Newark uh, International Airport was certainly a receiving center for folks who were coming in from West Africa. So as part of our rollout, all um, BLS and LS trucks were staffed with thermometers. And I don't generally advocate for uh, you know temperature as a regular, Practice, but nevertheless, we had additional data that we were able to help incorporate and add insight into our study. So there are a lot of folks that are presenting with a sepsis picture, and we found, again, in those cohorts that shock index improved. So high shock index goes to low shock index, which is optimizing our patient outcomes. Now, midazolam, right? So we're talking a little bit about etomidate, throwing some punches at it, saying, hey, etomidate's old school. But what's even before etomidate that we used to use? Midazolam. In fact, I just had a conversation with Dr. Nick Balfour, who's an EMS medical director out of British Columbia, and they intubate with M and M, midazolam and morphine. Oh. Fringe, right? Fringe, exactly. So he was very excited about this data, and we're happy that we have moved a long way from there, 
But nevertheless, midazolam is certainly not a hemodynamically neutral agent in RSI. You know you're going to make your patient hypotensive by inducing with Versed, right? Fair enough. Now what I wanted to try and do again, I'm probing my data, I'm trying to force it to answer the questions that I want to ask, is, is Versed associated with um, peri-intubation cardiac arrest? So we know the national averages of peri-intubation arrests are about 5%. And has that, has, have anybody experienced that? You're getting ready to RSI your patient, you induce and they arrest? Right, it's, it happens. It's really unfortunate and it just sucks. <laughs> so if we can do a better job in preventing that, certainly it's ideal. So I uh, looked at those patients, so I did a, again, looked at our data and looked at those patients that had uh, received Versed in our cohort. And unfortunately, there was no statistically significant effect associated with Versed, but again, it's a small sample size. So hopefully we'll continue looking at that in the future. Um, also wanted to mention here about 5% of our sample received push dose pressor. And as I'm understanding, Dr. Woods Curry in his talk mentioned it, and the talk prior to that in pseudo PEA also was talking about push dose pressor. So we incorporate that into al in our algorithms, and it's exact same uh, formula that's on MCRIT website, um, using your standard epinephrine to create a push dose pressor. And again, it drives that concept of resuscitating your patient before you intubate. Why? Because Dr. Levitan says your patient should survive the RSI process. Fair? All right, moving on. So talking a little bit about the nuances of chemistry. I'm going to read this just because it's a package insert so we can debate it, yeah. So ketamine is contraindicated in patients with any condition in which a significant elevation of blood pressure would be hazardous, such as severe cardiovascular disease, heart failure, which we're going to talk a little bit about, severe or poorly controlled hypertension or recent MI, stroke, etc., etc., blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now what I want to mention is, again, this is a package insert, so ketamine is also the preservative that's used in PLR, where it's in your picture is benzothonium chloride. Some folks have associated benzothonium chloride, the preservative, with the negative ionotropic effect associated with ketamine. No answer. Nevertheless, it's been implicated. Other, other comments? Oh, here we go. So, now, where does this come from? Where does this concept come from? And again, mentioned during the last talk, but a lot of the data regarding the negative inotropy of ketamine is not from human data. So if you want to talk about negative inotropy in ferrets and frogs, I can talk to you a little bit more about that. <laughs> if you want to talk about negative inotropic effects in rabbit ventricles, I can chat with you a little bit about that as well. But the majority of human studies are done both in vitro and the majority of the myocardium is done in healthy patients, right? So we know that the pathophysiology of those patients that have heart failure and who are, you know, circling the drain and peri-arrest is going to be a lot different. This is not going to translate in vivo. So a lot of limitations regarding the negative inotropy, and I know we talk a lot about that, the limitations of ketamine. We just don't know the answer. Nevertheless, as you guys know, I'm a very curious individual and I wanted to probe that data. And I looked at all the patients that have heart rate greater than 120 and an SCP of greater than 140. So our tachycardic hypertensive cohort. And we found that they did have a marginal decrease in the SCP from 158 to 136. And I had mentioned this earlier, they had a slightly increase in our shock index from 0.63 to 0.71. Those ended up both being statistically significant, but the gap there is whether or not that has a clinical significance. And I think using ketamine uh, a fair bit now and getting more practice with it, I think this does not necessarily translate to the clinical environment. Um, we do have to caution though for patients that have obstructing hydrocephalus, ketamine is probably not the best station. Uh, some bleeding patients that may have a subarachnoid hemorrhage that are markedly hypertensive, you know, you have to use caution. In heart failure, I think the jury is still out. Um, and then again, looking at our group to further define those with presumed sepsis. So a heart rate greater than 120 and an SCP of 110, less than 110. Ketamine did what it was supposed to do and our shock index improved. So just some general statistics here. Um, number of endotracheal tube attempts. So the large majority of folks were done on the first attempt. One unfortunate patient required five attempts. We won't get into that. Um, and patient contact time. So this is something that is very interesting to me. We talk about the concept of resuscitation before intubation. 
but ultimately we want that to correlate with outcomes, correct? We want our outcomes to improve, and the expense there, or the consequence, is that we're spending more time on CT. Okay, and I will advocate for my medics and say, hey, you guys have the skills to best treat your patient on scene and we're gonna figure out exactly what needs to be uh, diesel fuel and what you would ideally stay on the scene and resuscitate. So total transfer time was about 40, or total patient contact time was about 40 minutes and time on scene prior to transport was about 20 to 25 minutes and that includes, you know, adequate pre-oxygenation, denitrogenation, we know that's so important now in every single airway. Um, IVIO access, starting IV fluids, we said 5% of our patients received push dose pressors, and then uh, using ketamine as an induction agent. So again, talking a little bit about the subtleties and nuances, post RSI fentanyl, we had just introduced this in the middle of uh, 2015 with our new EMS fellow class. So um, about 40% of our sample received post RSI fentanyl, and that's much higher now that folks are comfortable with that. In fact, when we're giving the online med control orders, we'll concomitantly give our post intubation sedation so that um, that's not an issue while the medics are in transport. Uh, this is cool, this is a hot map of ketamine. So these are the centers that we were transporting patients to and the percentage of patients that were brought after a ketamine induction. And you guys, I'm sure, have the exact same experience that you're transporting folks and inducing with ketamine. Sometimes when you show up in the emergency department, the docs, you know, especially in 2014, were like, what? You induced with ketamine? How did you get ketamine? I don't even have that in my emergency department. I have to call anesthesia, this, that, and the other. So that was part of the process too, and we had some growing pains, but overall we have broad-based support now for ketamine-induced inductions. Next step. So the first step was called skeptic. Right? Now that we have everyone on board, we are going all out. Next study is going to be called Kamikaze. Okay? <laughs> Patients of ketamine, amidate, and midazolam inductions in evolution to the next generation of pre-hospital airway policy. So this is again currently underway. This is retrospective review. Now comparing all our data with ketamine as our induction agent. Uh, prior to that was etomidate, and even prior to that was <laughs> Now, just as a point of clarification, we do not carry rocuronium, much to my chagrin. All these patients were intubated with succinylcholine as a parallel. Okay, skeptic, followed by kamikaze, followed by Kevlar. So we're also medical directors of the New Jersey State Police, and we are very tactically oriented. So once we've now defined this retrospectively, as the nature of pre-hospital research goes, we want to be bulletproof. Right, so the next prospective study is gonna be entitled Kevlar and we hope to get that underway shortly. So future, di future directions. Ketamine for post-intubation sedation, I think we've beaten that over the horse, right? It's certainly easy as I'm, as I'm giving an online med control order, intubate with ketamine and then use that for post-RSI sedation as well. That's easy, we should be doing that. And I've heard some feedback from folks, they have it now on their RSI algorithms, but don't have it on their post-RSI sedation algorithms, which is unfortunate but we will hopefully build a literature base to help support that. Ketamine-supported intubations, so KSI. Now this is a concept, you may have a patient group that you're just a little bit nervous about giving them a paralytic agent. And we had an interesting case with an 89-year-old woman who was undergoing an anaphylactic reaction. She was getting both IM, a couple of doses of IM uh, epi, we converted to IV epi, and she had an anaphylaxis like you wouldn't believe. Um, at this point was breathing on her own, our medic called and was like, guys, I want to try a KSI, ketamine supported intubation, induced with ketamine only, no paralytic, was able to get a beautiful glottic view and was intubated her successfully. Now interestingly in transport, because of all the epi we had given her, she had transiently gotten some ST elevations, which resolved by the time she got to the emergency department. But nevertheless, had she lost her airway, Forget about it, right? So we felt good about the case, and she had a good outcome. Also. Now, ketamine, we also talked about for delayed sequence intubation. Now, all of you guys are RSI, uh, it's almost all of you guys are RSI, but there are certain folks who don't have the capability or ability to RSI in their practice. Now, you have an agitated hypoxic patient, you know, are you gonna use a big slug of etomidate uh, by itself and try and intubate them? That sounds like not the ideal way to pursue your airway, right? So giving ketamine, as part of your DSI algorithm, 
and placing your patient on CPAP and then ultimately transporting them to the ED, right? Dr. Abernathy talks about the continuum of pre-hospital care, transitioning from the pre-hospital space to the emergency department, to the ICU for our sickest patients. So perhaps, for those folks certainly who aren't RSI and don't have the ability to stay on scene and optimally pre-oxygenate and denitrogenate their patients, this may be an option for future pre-hospital use. Maybe, right? So these are obviously going to be very sick patients and we have to be judicious in the way we pursue this, but it's certainly something that's worth further perspective review and we have a study that's um, underway by one of our EMS fellows now looking at this. We have about 25 to 30 cases. And the way we coordinate it is we call the emergency department directly, speak with that attending physician and say, hey guys, we are coming in hot. So call your RT, prepare for the intubation. We're going to make sure that they're pre-oxygenated and denitrogenated and we'll hand them off to you in a safe manner and secure that advanced airway. Following Dash 1A, of course. EMS Nation. Thank you so much for listening to the podcast and thank you so much for dedicating yourself on a daily basis to go out there and provide incredibly high quality pre-hospital care and to committing to be on a path of both personal improvement as well as systems-based performance enhancement. Now, we'd like to remind you we could really use your support. If you happen to have an Apple Watch We'd love it for you to download the perfect CPR app and use it during training and let us know what feedback you have. At present, it's designed to give audio as well as haptic feedback during training cardiac arrest scenarios. And our hope is this can help improve outcomes both in the community and on a systems-wide basis to help decrease the disparity in outcomes in out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. Please tune in for the next episode of EMS Nation during EMS Week. This is Faison Arshad, wishing everyone a safe tour.